Nintendo Switch, we all know the score. It uses a mobile chipset based on Nvidia's Tegra X1 processor. But it's actually running downclocked compared to products like Nvidia's own Shield Android TV, which is using the same chip. Historically, at its best, the CPU hits 1020 MHz on Switch, while the GPU maxes at 768 MHz when docked. But homebrew developers have recently created tools that allow the Switch to run faster, much faster, pretty much on par with Nvidia's max spec. And actually, prior to that, Nintendo itself started to experiment with more aggressive clocks for selected games, and those experiments are ongoing with some fascinating results, to the point where people are even starting to talk about a boost mode of sorts for Nintendo's hybrid. The reality there perhaps isn't as dramatic compared to the PS4 Pro's equivalent mode, but there's certainly a story here. Okay, so way, way back in December 2016, I revealed how fast the Tegra X1 processor in the Switch actually runs, and to be honest, it kind of upset a lot of people. Nintendo prioritized stuff like system stability and thermal management over out-and-out -out performance. In truth, the same kind of compromises that all console manufacturers build into their designs. So, I've already mentioned the dock speeds here, but Nintendo also created a handheld configuration. CPU speed stayed at 1020 MHz, but the GPU ran at just 307.2 MHz when gaming on the go, with memory frequency also dropping from 1600 MHz to 1331. The reason that CPU clocks are the same between docked and mobile play is that it allows for the game simulation to be entirely identical in both configurations. They'll play the same, and the difference in GPU clocks sees to it that it's only the graphics that change between docked and portable states. But 307.2 MHz, that's like 40% of the full docked power. Now, yes, there are a bunch of great games that do run well at that reduced clock, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, for example, but when the system moved closer to launch, Nintendo realized it would need more horsepower for the mobile form factor, so another configuration was added, allowing for 384 MHz on the GPU, basically a full 50% of the docked frequency, and a 25% performance uplift over the prior mobile configuration. The situation has evolved since then. Now, I'm not entirely sure when this happened, but I am aware of three games that run these days at a different, more powerful configuration in portable mode. So that will be The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey for starters, which retain the 1020 MHz CPU clock and 1331 MHz for the memory speed, typical to switch mobile play. But GPU frequency has now increased to 460 MHz, and that's a straight 20% uplift in performance over the previous high end of 384, and just a touch under 50% compared to the 307.2 MHz mode. So yeah, wow. In the case of Super Mario and Zelda, we can assume that the clock speed increase lessens the impact of dynamic resolution scaling and also maintains better performance, more stable performance if you like. Now, back in the day, we chuckle at Zelda patch notes describing a more pleasant experience. But I'd imagine that adding 20% more GPU power to mobile mode would actually deliver that. But remarkably, there is actually a third game that uses the new mobile GPU clock boost. And for once, it's not actually a first party game. It's Mortal Kombat 11 from Neverrealm Studios. Just like Super Mario, it targets and mostly achieves 60 frames per second. And just like Mario, it also uses dynamic resolution scaling. But unlike Nintendo's masterpiece, it also drops frames quite regularly in certain levels, which made me wonder, what if that new 460 megahertz mode hadn't been available? What if the developers were limited to 384 megahertz instead, or worse still, 307.2? Doubtless the game makers would adapt and possibly pare back visuals still further, but with a bit of thought, we can indeed run MK11 in other portable clock configurations. So I decided to buy an old Switch, exploit it, and run a homebrew tool called SysClock on it. 
Don't try this at home, folks, because any kind of hack on your Switch could potentially lead to an online ban. Personally, I did this because I wanted to gain a greater understanding of how the Switch works. But basically, SysClock essentially allows us to monitor the changes in frequency across CPU, GPU, and the memory, the EMC, the uh, embedded memory controller. So yeah, all of the stats I've come up with so far, they've been verified using SysClock. But more than that, it opens up all of the available Tegra X1 frequencies to be applied to the games of your choice. But in the here and now, we can take Mortal Kombat 11 and use the replay mode to benchmark the game at the three available portable clock speed configurations. Okay, a quick primer on methodology here. We saved a game replay on one of the switches with a portable video out mod, which gives us a pristine quality video feed of mobile performance. We use it in all of our analysis these days for Switch titles. Then we ran the same replay on the new exploited Switch. The problem being that this has no video output mod. So I actually filmed the screen here and uh, in a rather torturous exercise, manually counted the drop frames. You can see how that works here. Frames are blended at 60 FPS filming with a 60 FPS camera, but when a frame is dropped, the blending stops. The same image has persisted for twice as long, allowing us to identify slowdown. A filmed feed is obviously pretty ugly, but let's go with it and hope for a route to direct capture at a later date. Okay, so at stock, 460 megahertz, the new performance profile for mobile play. Mortal Kombat 11 can drop frames in this particular level, as you can see here. The game does use dynamic resolution scaling, so we could possibly assume that even with a lowered resolution, there's still not enough overhead to hit 60 frames per second. And that's kind of what we need to judge relative performance between the three Switch portable modes. Now let's stop here after Scorpion's fiery attack. Frame rate has dropped to 50 FPS in the standard stock configuration, and immediately prior to this clip, you can see that the graph line much closer to 60 frames per second. Running the same replay at 384 megahertz on the GPU, uh, the speed that used to be the Switch's higher end configuration. Well, now we're at 46 frames per second, and the action leading up to that attack was a lot less stable. Curiously though, further on, there are similar dips. It's difficult to draw too many conclusions here because we don't know how the dynamic resolution scaler works and the extent to which it may be changing performance on the fly here. But dropping down to 307.2 megahertz, well, the entire line of performance drops significantly and the frame rate is just 36 frames per second in this crunch point. 14 frames per second slower than the new mobile configuration that's open to developers. So let's try another comparison this time. A little less extreme in terms of the performance here and going from 460 to 384 megahertz here. Not seeing a huge amount of difference, but again, we're not entirely sure how that DRS dynamic resolution system works and how it kicks in and the extent to which resolution may be adjusted on the fly. And you'll also note that there are variations in the background here, which is kind of curious. The gate there hasn't opened yet and an on-screen character is missing, so it's not entirely like for like. But as we move on to the 307.2 clock, performance is way, way down to 44 frames per second and you can see that the whole line is constrained there. Again, I guess dynamic resolution isn't much help if you've lost 50% of your GPU horsepower. My gut feeling here is that possibly the Switch version in portable mode was designed with 384 megahertz in mind, and the 460 mode was quite possibly a late addition that just added nicely to overall performance and kept the game more closely locked to its target 60 frames per second. And one thing I do need to stress here is that this is pretty much the most stressful level in the game in terms of GPU load. Right then, just to answer a question you may have, why run the footage in sequence rather than with a standard three-way comparison? And why not just replace the filmed feeds with the direct capture since it's the same content? Well, we've already seen an element of change in the background, but more importantly, lowering clocks doesn't just drop frames in the replay. It also physically slows the game down. And you can see that here. Dropping clocks to 384 megahertz only causes about a 5% slowdown in overall replay speed. But at 307.2 megahertz, it's more like 
18 to 19 percent slower or thereabouts. But you know what? There's more to this switch overclocking than the 460 megahertz GPU mode. There's the recent talk of a boost mode of sorts that allegedly decreases loading time significantly. And using sysclock to monitor the speeds the switch operates at during any given point, we can see exactly how this works. But to begin with, I want to show off the most dramatic example I could find of this boost mode in effect. Uh, so yeah, Super Mario Odyssey's latest patch unlocks a VR mode of sorts, but it also uses the new boost technology. And here's the difference in loading times when booting the game. So yeah, this is pretty significant. The latest patch boots the game in just 20 seconds up against the 28 of the last version of the game before I updated. Looking at the frequency logs, we can see that during loading, the Tegra X1 CPU cores clock up from 1020 MHz to 1785, literally a 75% uplift in frequency. Why would this affect loading times? Well, uh, you see, loading isn't just about the speed of your media, though of course it is obviously very important, but the fact is that data is usually compressed to save size on your storage, and so obviously it needs to be decompressed when it moves into memory. And of course, decompressing happens a ton faster if your CPU clocks have just gone up by 75%. Interestingly though, I don't see much difference during in-game loading. Super Mario Odyssey is already really quick here, so it's just a second or two difference. Same with The Legend of Zelda here, which is also boost enabled with its new VR patch. Looking at the clock speed logs, I can confirm that CPU increases to 1785 megahertz during loading times there too. But I guess that maybe the loading times have already been pretty well optimized and possibly it's the storage speed itself that is more important at that point. Now you might be thinking that an extra 75% of CPU frequency can't be free. There has to be a trade somewhere, a compromise. And yeah, it may have a mild impact on battery life, but it's not gonna overheat your switch or anything because when a game is loading, not much is happening on the graphics side, typically. So there's actually a ton of overhead because the main juice guzzler in the Switch, the GPU, is mostly inactive at this point. So there's no worries at all about hitting thermal limits. So that's how Nintendo is basically overclocking your Switch now. We have a strategic OC in place that speeds up loading time significantly and a new portable performance mode that gives demanding games an extra 20% of GPU frequency. And yeah, that can make a difference. Now, will Nintendo improve docked performance with a clock boost there? Well, I remember those reports of switches bending in the dock, so I do wonder if it will happen, but I can confirm that the GPU can run up to a maximum of 921 megahertz, a 20% clock boost over the standard docked configuration. So there is overhead there. Nintendo also has the option of clocking the memory controller to the full 1600 megahertz in portable mode. And there's also the possibility that CPU clocks could be pushed to 1224 megahertz for gaming. And as I understand it, this is actually supported at the system level now. It's just not being used by any games. I think there's more to this story then, and I intend to look further into it, but that's all I have for you now. And yup, you know what's coming next. Please like and subscribe to support work like this and ring the bell for instant notifications when a new DF video drops. Obviously, projects like this take a lot of time and effort to put into practice. So to support the DF team and what we do more directly, please consider our Patreon where your contribution helps us immensely and gives you access to pristine versions of every video we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.